All right, well, I'm gonna start recording. Awesome, well, welcome everyone. Excited to be back with another free webinar here at uh, Shifting Schools, part of Reimagine. Uh, we are here today with the one, the only, Mr. Steve Murphy. And over in the chat in three, two, one, there is a link to today's presentation that Steve is gonna be going through. If you'd like to go through that with, uh, with him as he's going through it, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So Steve, you can share your screen if you wanna get set up. And I'm going to turn it over to Steve as he is going to walk us through something that, um, you know, I think we talk a lot about. And I love this idea, that even just the title of your, of your presentation, right? Creating Global Citizens. And the thing I love about this is almost every district I work with, their mission statement or their vision statement somewhere talks about creating global citizens. <laughs> how do you do that? What, what is behind it? And how do we stay focused on this no matter what? And we were, I was just on another call where we we're talking about, you know what, the thing I love about the things that we cover in these webinars is we're just talking about good teaching and learning. It doesn't care if you're from a distance. I don't care if you're in an A, B schedule. And I don't care if we go back to whatever quote unquote traditional learning looks like, right? That this is just good learning. Uh, in 2020 and beyond. And so I'm so excited to be covering this. I know it's a passion of yours and I'm excited to learn from you today, Steve. So without further ado, Mr. Steve Murphy, I turn it over to you, my friend. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. And thank you everybody for being here. Uh, it really truly is a, a passion for me um, and what I believe in and what I believe in for my, not just my school, but for all of our students throughout our country and throughout our world, quite frankly. Uh, and that is the idea of focusing on creating global citizens and using technology and leveraging technology to be able to do that. Uh, and so as we get started with this, I'm just excited to share that passion that I have for you or uh, that I have with you uh, and what we're gonna do. So I'm just gonna introduce myself real quick. I'm Steve Murphy from Enumclaw. I'm from Enumclaw High School. I'm a social studies teacher here part-time and then I'm a part-time tech coach at the high school as well, as well as a facilitator with Shifting Schools and Reimagine Washington Ed, which has been a great professional challenge and, and boost to my career for me. So it's been great working with teachers from all over the state. So I wanna start by saying thank you to all of you for everything that you've been doing for kids, uh, everything you've been doing for families, just all the work and effort that you're putting in. I know what that grind is like. And you know, if you just got started this week or if you've been started for the last couple of weeks, just you know, keep it up, you're, you're doing a great job. Uh, I'm, background for me is I graduated from the University of Washington with a double major in political science and communications, public relations. And so it's a very much a part of my life and my mindset to think about communicating, uh, but also to think about things from a, a global perspective when it comes to political science and just history and the history of the world in general. So budding world traveler is what I would say, or human, humanitarian. The challenging of the budding world traveler is right now with COVID, I'm wondering when I get to travel the world again. So I'm hoping that happens fairly soon and we get a chance to do that to be able to get out there. But last year, uh, I was really challenged, I think, in my thought process and my thinking and moving towards blended learning on what I wanted my students to be able to take away from my class. And I, I just wanted to come up with what a mission statement was for me and what I wanted to have as a mission for my students. And that mission statement basically boiled down to all the different thoughts that I've had throughout the 20 plus years of teaching. And it came down to one sentence. And that is that I wanted to develop empathetic global citizens that were gonna be able to have a passion for service leadership. So everything that I do in my classroom, whether that's my US history class, my AP human geography class, my government class, or for all of my teachers that are teaching all the other topics, that's what I want to be able to develop is empathetic students. I think empathy is huge. Empathetic students uh, that are global citizens and then they have that passion for service leadership. So as we get started, I wanted to just preview for you what we're gonna cover in this webinar and what uh, the objectives are and what I'd like to be able to, to see us hopefully achieve by the time that we're done here. So with only an hour to share, I really wanna make sure that we are focusing on getting to that information and giving you an opportunity to be able to think globally and how you could add that to your classroom. So I'm gonna share parts of my experience that I've gone through, things that have worked for me, things that haven't, things that I've learned from, and trying to become a teacher that emphasizes global citizenship. So by the end of this presentation, I want you to be able to recognize the significance of creating global citizens. Why is that important in our classroom? Why is that important in our, in our communities in general? We also wanna be able to identify strategies okay, for making those global connections. So how can we do that? It seems like a pretty daunting task and a pretty big task. And that's what I hope to be able to make sure in the next you know, 60 minutes, 30 minutes of presentation and then our question and answer time to help you to be able to understand that it's really not this huge 
overarch o overwhelming thing that you can't make happen. You absolutely can make it happen, especially if you start simple. And we want to evaluate some of the several technology tools that could aid you in this and how you could be able to um, put them to, in place and be able to use them with your students. And finally, I guess, you know, I'm going to share some examples, um, you know, of how I've incorporated this into my classroom and how, how I put that together. And I want you to consider okay, some examples of these global classroom connections that I have and then be thinking and evaluating how or if they would work for you and how they could be modified to allow you to be able to, to put those together in your classroom and provide those opportunities for your students. So thanks again for being here. Uh, I'm excited to have the opportunity to do this and to share with you. And so let's go ahead and, and get ourselves started. So what does it mean to be a global citizen? You know, and when we think about what does it mean to be a global citizen also, you know, how is this good for your students? How is this good for you as a teacher? How is this good for your classroom and just society in general? And I think it starts with being able to define what global citizen is or what a global citizen is. And so in the lower right hand corner there, I have a definition for you. And I don't necessarily want to patronize to you, but I do think it's important that we read this quote. So it says a global citizen is someone who is aware of and understands the wider world and their place in it. They take an active role in their community and they work with others to make our planet more equal, fair, and sustainable. And as I talk with my students all the time about being a global citizen, I think it's important to then dive into that definition that much more specifically to, say, to pull out the parts that are of significance. So when it says they're aware of and understand the wider world, that is hard for a lot of our young students, especially, and again, for us, and I think some of you and seeing where you're from are in a similar cir circumstance, Enumclaw is a fairly small town. And for a lot of our students, the lens that they've seen everything through in their life is pretty narrow focused. And it's pretty, you know, American centered or just their own town centered. So just the idea of making them aware of this wider world that's out there is a significant part of their learning and being able to become a global citizen. And then understanding what their place is in it, that it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a smaller place, but they do have a significant place in it also in being able to make the world a better place and be able to allow different people to have different opportunities. So the other part I think that's of significance when it comes to global citizens, citizenship is providing them opportunities to take an active role in their community or take an active role in seeking out that additional learning that's there. So rather than just a passive learning of learning something in a textbook or reading something uh, or, or watching a video of something, having them have some type of project, which we're gonna get into down the road here that causes them to make, take that active role uh, and be able to you know, create more, more fair, a, mer a more fair world, excuse me, okay, um, and make it more sustainable. And the power of this comes from just you know, building their understanding of world events. So they're being inundated. The modern day youth generation is being inundated with world events, whether they want to or not. Social media, uh, the news, television news, on movies, what they hear their parents talking about, they hear the community talking about it is significantly important for them to be educated about what's happening globally, to be able to participate in those discussions and understand what's happening there. And one of my favorite things to do throughout my whole school year is with my, I just did this last week with my human geography students, and that was to show them a video about how big or, you know, the world is as big or small as you make it, and then ask them, because it's about students that are interacting with other students around the globe in different places, and then ask them afterwards, how does this change your perspective of education? How does this change your perspective of, you know, just the world in general? And overwhelmingly, every single one of them, just this last week, and it just gives you some pride and some, some good thoughts about the young people in, in our world today, they said, wow, I didn't know that there was so many different ideas and different thoughts that are out there, but they finished by saying, but they're teenagers just like me. Like they finish by saying, you know, they're, they're, they have a different culture, but they are very much like me. They have the same interests. They have the same questions that I have. They're going through those same things. And so they all of a sudden get exposed to this huge world that's out there, but also recognize that we're all in this together. And so that's a huge part for me of what it means to be a global citizen. So I'm guessing that I don't necessarily have to convince you about why it's important to be a global citizen because you're here in this webinar, right? You've joined us in this webinar, uh, but it's just in case, I wanna make sure that we are also talking about authentic learning and the idea that this is supported by research and this is supported by professionals. Uh, we're talking about what we wanna do in our classrooms. And so these are just a couple of recent articles that um, I found 
about what's been going on here just within COVID. You know, on the article on the left there, and these are links, by the way, that of the slide, slide deck that Jeff shared with you in case you're interested in digging into them further. But, you know, how making global connections helps school in crisis during COVID-19. How, do, how does it help for us to know that we're still connected to other people that are outside of, you know, the area that we're not able to leave at this particular point, you know, and then, you know, five ways to come back you know, classroom uh, isolation and be able to expand that. And I'm gonna go ahead and give credit to here. I don't know where the credit should actually go, but I got a chance to work with the amazing Tyler Rablin throughout the course of our Reimagine and what we put together in the spring and, and in August. And I am now, this is a significant part of my classroom, what's on the left there on the screen. And that is for the, my students to become critical consumers and powerful communicators. And I think if we give them the opportunity to see what's out there globally, and teach them the idea of how to be a critical consumer of trying to make sure that you're understanding what the information is that's coming to you and not just believing it right off the top, but also not dismissing it right off the top of being a critical consumer and then being a powerful communicator. And the, the power of being able to do that with a global audience, the power of being able to get different viewpoints from around the world and trying to critically consume that and then being able to communicate with them as well. Uh, different cultures across different types of medium, all of that is a significant part of the development of creating a, a, a just a, a well-rounded global citizen. So how is my world, a little bit of my story so you understand where I came from, how has my world opened up to this? It started probably with just teaching the AP Human Geography class, uh, just being able to talk about global issues and, and being able to talk about global uh, content. But it really was pushed forward with a couple of ex, uh, exchange students, a couple of foreign exchange students that we had in our school. And this was both on a professional and a personal basis. You know, if I really authentically just kind of talk to you about how this was, was set up, but watching in my classroom, Mario on the left here is an exchange student from Switzerland who I still stay in touch with this day. It was a number of years ago that he was here. I remember <clears throat> watching him sit in class and watching students just ask him questions and being able to create circumstances and situations for students to be able to ask him questions and the authenticity of having somebody sitting right there in front of you from a foreign country and being able to answer those questions, be able to ask questions of us, uh, being able to tell about his culture was just powerful. It was powerful for the students and it made me start to think, how can I bring this into my classroom even if I don't have a foreign exchange student? How can I bring this type of experience of getting connected with things that are global without having a foreign exchange student in my class? And all those foreign exchange students in my class have been phenomenal when it comes to this. Quinty from the Netherlands was here just this last year and actually is now to this day my, my daughter's best friend. And so she became a good friend of our family. Um, but again, the same type of thing of being able to go on, on, on vacation or go away and have her travel with us and watching my son, who was a seventh grader at the time, ask questions about the Netherlands. And it just opened up this kind of perspective of this is a powerful thing for our young people to be able to have in their lives if we can make that happen. So that's where it was pushed forward with me. I knew that I always wanted to do it as well as some other professional opportunities that were there as well. So, and I'll get into some of those when, when we start to talk about this. So here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about how many people do you think that you need to know to connect your students with the rest of the world? So as you're sitting here and going, okay, this all sounds great. This all sounds like a, something that I wanna do, but I don't necessarily even know where I would even start. This seems like a big giant thing for me. It's, it's too much for me to be able to do. How many people, Okay, do you think you need to know in order to connect your students with the rest of the world? And then how many people do you actually know that you think could fit this particular bill and this uh, could work for you in being able to do this? And the answer to that question is honestly just one. It starts with one, right? It starts with one connection that you have that might be a friend that you talk about. I, and, I, and I don't say this to kind of downplay it or make fun of it in any way. But I, I remember thinking, okay, well, that person is just my friend and somebody I've always known forever. They're not gonna be that big of a, of a deal in my classroom, but to the students, they are, right? For me, it's somebody I've always hung out with, I've always been a part of, and to the students, it's somebody that has a different perspective and a different idea of, about whatever it is that we're talking about, especially if they're coming to them from a different country or even if they're you know, teaching abroad or whatever, that situation could be. You obviously need a little help with technology. That's how you're gonna be able to connect things globally as best as possible. 
but really it starts with just that one person and then it will build from there. I have to give Jeff some credit in being able to allow me to be able to do this in my classroom as well, because when we first met and we were first working together, one of the things we did is we co-taught a lesson and we co-designed a lesson about connecting our students to an event that was happening in the Middle East. And it was being able to bring in a couple of friends, professional colleagues that Jeff had that were teaching in the Middle East and be able to bring them in and on a, on a Google Hangout, I think I can't remember what it was at the time, it was like Google Hangout Live or YouTube Live or something like that. Um, and we brought them in, we're able to have them talk with my students. And just the idea of watching them talk with those students, and then the next day actually was the best part of it. Jeff wasn't there for that. But the next day was, how did that go? How did you think that was? And it was like through the roof, like that was so cool. I can't believe we talked to somebody from the Middle East. Like it was just, it was amazing to watch their excitement and their then furthered interest of wanting to do that further. And this just came up today. This wasn't even a part of my planning, but I'm going to go ahead and bring it up. I just was talking with my students today about the fact that in the next two weeks, three weeks, I'm hoping to connect us with somebody from Australia. And you should have seen the look on their faces on their Zoom. It was, it was like, the, like it was their birthday. Like they were just like, oh my gosh, that's going to be so cool. That's going to be amazing. So just being able to do that is, is a powerful thing with your students. There's a couple of resources there for you. And Stefan and I talked in the spring when we did our webinar on learning with and without walls about blended learning, about how to be able to try and you know, break this down. And how do, we, how do we break down the walls of our classroom to be able to allow our students to be able to learn anytime, anywhere? Well, this is breaking down the walls of your classroom to make it global, right? It's not just about the learning within what you're doing locally. This is about making it global as well. So what are some of the strategies? Okay, what are some of the strategies that you can use to be able to connect yourself uh, globally and be able to find these contacts. I'm going to give you later in our session here, later in our webinar, uh, some a Google My Maps little collaborative activity. And so I'm not going to talk about it too much right here, but Google My Maps would be a great way for you to collaborate locally to connect globally. And I'll explain how we're using that in our district here and how I'm using that in my classroom. And then we're going to get a chance to do that as well. But an interactive map to be able to have a resource of connected or connections, I should say. Flipgrid. Flipgrid is a significant part of what I do in my classroom. I love using Flipgrid. We've been using it for the last couple of weeks. Uh, you can expand that to be able to connect with global audience as well. And so Grid Pals, which I'll show you later in the session, Grid Pals is a way for you to be able to connect with other teachers around the world and be able to do so in a way that would allow you to communicate with them. Facebook and Twitter. If you were a part of Reimagine previously, we've talked heavily about feeding yourself, right? We've talked heavily about your, your PLN and your, your professional learning network and being able to use those to leverage and be able to find more resources. And Twitter is a great way for you to be able to do that. I would highly recommend, however, you know, start simple and keep your eyes and ears open for opportunities. And that's a huge part of making this happen is just in the moment, not planning it necessarily, but in the moment, just recognizing this could be a, a particular way that we could bring the outside world into our classroom. And then finally, you know, RSS feeds and finding professional resources and blogs that you uh, like and blogs that are, are beneficial for you, feeding yourself about how to do this. You know, you could find, I mentioned this as strategies and the idea of how you can get ideas of how you can find other connected connections to people outside in the rest of the world, but also those blogs could be a way, those people you could blog with, right? If you're blogging back and forth and putting information there, they could potentially be somebody that is, uh, could be in your classroom as well. So here's what I'd like to do in the chat. Okay. In the chat, can you just take a moment and I'll let Jeff monitor that portion of things, but what are some ways uh, that you have connected or feel that you could connect with people? What are some ways, because some of you maybe have already done this, right? And so this is a, an idea of all of us collaborating and trying to work together to help one another be able to enhance this as best we possibly can in our classroom. But what are some ways that you have connected or you feel you could connect okay, with people outside of your town, outside of your country? And I'll let Jeff kind of just monitor the chat there real quick. Yeah, I think for me, as people are typing, I think for me, uh, Twitter has always been, uh, I call it the virtual staff lounge, right, of educators. 
Uh, that time when you and I, you know, wanted to, we're trying to find some people. It was literally a tweet. I sent out a tweet <laughs> and just said, Hey, we're looking for anybody in the middle East that wants to come talk to some ninth graders. Anybody willing yeah. to give us 15 minutes, you know? Yeah. Um, I love what Tony just said there, you know, a composer that ordered music from in the past. Hey, okay? and then, you know, back and forth with them, being able to connect with them, bringing Australia yeah. to Sunnyside. How awesome would that be? Yeah. That's great. awesome. We'll be thinking about that. I'll let you continue LinkedIn. Yeah, for LinkedIn, sure. Another great one. A lot of professionals on LinkedIn. If you're looking for LinkedIn's a great one. I think we forget about LinkedIn a lot in uh, education because we don't use it. But if you're looking for professionals to bring professionals in, like you want a professional accountant or a scientist or somebody that works at a company, LinkedIn is a great place uh, to go out and make those connections and have people have people come in. So it's always a good one to remember. I always forget about LinkedIn, even though I use it. I never think of it in that, in that sense, you know, I mean, to yeah. your point, these connections are around us. They are, you know, and you just have to be thinking about them in that, in that lens of how, how can I leverage these for my kids? So they, they absolutely are. And, you know, and then I think that's a great point to be made, Jeff, is that they're around us if you're aware of it. Right. And so that's why I think under the Facebook and Twitter part, I you know, said, look for opportunities. You need to start to think about, it doesn't mean you have to think, <clears throat> excuse me, it doesn't mean you have to think about your class and what you're trying to do content like 24 hours a day, but just be aware of when you're having a conversation or if you're on vacation or if something comes up, just, you know, somebody that you could potentially connect with. Um, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm going to give you a couple of examples later that came out of that and were born out of that, right? And that's where it was. It was just a conversation where we were on a camping trip and it was all of a sudden, you know what, that could be something that could connect with a classroom. Would you ever be willing to be in my classroom? And they say, yes, and you get your number and you can contact them later. And people are happy to share about, their, their, about what they're passionate about and, and where they live. So with all of these resources, okay, and the many more that are out there, okay, basically what you've done okay, um, as, as we do this is you've created your network right? You've created your network of being able to connect with people, your professional learning network. And again, it starts with one, right? It starts with just one. Don't feel like you have to have these amazing contacts to start with. Just start simple and it'll build from there. And the next thing you know, you'll be able to have more people come in. So the important part of this, okay, if you have this growing network, you know, is, is now what? You know, what, what's, what are the next steps? Well, first of all, you're the expert, okay? You're the expert in your content and in your curriculum, so you need to evaluate your curriculum and choose where that's going to connect the best. You know, wh wh where, where is it going to be within what lesson? It doesn't have to be all the time, okay? but within what lesson, within which, which piece of content is that going to be the best fit for you? You know, what, and so the reflection you know, is, is, as you're thinking through this, is what lessons or topics could you connect with a global partner? Really, it's any of them, right? If you really want me to be honest, it's any of them. But there's some that are sometimes easier than others. And I think the question that comes up often is, you know, which comes first? Does the content come first or does the connection come first, right? Or, the, you know, the connection piece. I think it could be either or. You know, I don't know, you know, Jeff's thoughts are on that. But it could be that, you know, I just find somebody that's from a different country and, man, they're, they're willing to be in my classroom. I'll figure out a way to connect that to my content. Or it could be, you know, I have this content that I would really like to reach out, like the lesson that Jeff and I put together, really like to reach out to somebody in the Middle East. We're going to try and find somebody from this region because that's the current event that we want to talk about. So you have the ability to put that together and think of how it could fit best. So, you know, is there a scientist you could bring in? You know, Jeff and I were just talking beforehand about the smoke. You know, if you want to start to talk about, you know, how, how do we get rid of the smoke? Why does the smoke stay here? Why is it staying here with all these different wildfires? Reach out to a scientist that you have, a friend that you have, a meteorologist that you have, that, you know, a friend that would maybe potentially want to be there. Or even reach out to some of the meteorologists that are on the local news. They might be willing to take, you know, 30 minutes and join your class. You know, could, could you blog with a, an author for language arts, right? Could you blog with them and connect with them and have your students write for them? Think about the power of that writing. You know, maybe even an inspirational talk or goal setting talk from a, a professional athlete or from someone that you know is playing in college sports. You know, it could be a former high school player that's now playing college baseball that is just a player that you used to have on your team or a player you used to have in your class. But to the to a middle school kid or to a high school kid, that's a pretty powerful message, you know, and bringing them in uh, out there, out from there, an artist, a musician, as has already been mentioned. So, you know where it fits, right? And this can't be something that's written into a district-wide curriculum. Uh, this is something that you know, has, to, has to fit for you, right? So this is a personal piece. So, and my, my biggest recommendation is be to start small. Don't start with this huge project. Just start small. Start with a simple, bring them in for a little bit, even the easiest of, of, connect, uh, of connections that you have. 
of contacts that you have and have them come into your classroom. And then you'll be able to build it from there. I think that's the, the biggest place that it starts. So I have two examples of how I blended my curriculum, okay? And how I'm going to hopefully blend my curriculum. I kind of gave you a little preview of that just a minute ago um, with my network. And again, this network came in, in kind of unique ways and how it came up, but I'll go ahead and share those with you. First of all, we did a lesson and we do a lesson in human geography about finding about development and it's about working with less developed countries and the idea of how we move them to more development to be able to provide better situations for learning again here's where that empathy piece comes in right better quality of life and you know how can we go about doing that and so i want to tell you a little bit about haiti here and what haiti is okay, is a or i shouldn't say that the, not what haiti is you know what haiti is it's a country but what the project was was trying to be able to put together a plan of how Haiti or a less developed country would move to more developed status. And so this is a picture of my cousin, my wife's cousin, Jeff, my cousin, I guess, that's on the screen. And that's actually my daughter. That's why I felt comfortable using the picture, right? So that's my daughter that's, that's, that's there talking with him. But we were bringing Haiti into our classroom to explain, this was after the hurricane and the extreme poverty that was happening there, of what was going on in Haiti and how we would come potentially kind of address those issues. And so we, have, we were able to speak with someone who was from that country, being able to talk like a reporter on site, being able to say, this is what we're experiencing, this is what we're seeing. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the projects that, or some of the problems that can come with this down the road that you need to be prepared for. Because when Jeff, my cousin, was trying to show us some things, the Wi-Fi wasn't strong enough, he tried to go outside to show us what Haiti looked like and it was, it was um, basically the, the Wi-Fi wasn't strong enough, right? It wasn't working strong enough. So uh, that, that was what was happening there. Um, but it was powerful. The next day when we were able to check with them and be able to see, hey, how did this go? What did you think about this? They were blown away by getting a chance to talk with Haiti. And they were able to say that, you know, that this was uh, the, one of the most powerful learning experiences they had. And it was much more authentic learning than them learning it out of the textbook. My second example is what I hope to come up here in the next couple of weeks. And I mentioned to you about connecting with friends in Australia. So we met some friends who we've stayed in touch with for about five years now on a vacation who are from Australia. We met the father and the two sons and their families, and we got a chance to talk with them. And it was a week long vacation that we were there and we just became good friends and we haven't lost touch since. We've Zoomed with them or we've done FaceTime with them. In fact, they joined me. Uh, on to on the end here in the picture that you see there, but they joined me for a mystery guest in the spring when we were in first in doing this in COVID and this online learning piece. And so they would join and they would join the, the, the Zoom for my human geography students and my human geography students would have to figure out where they were from. They had to come up with questions. They had to come up with 20 questions and they had to try and come up with where they were from. And then they got a chance once they figured out where they were from of being, we'd show them on Google Maps, right, where their house was. And then we would, because I, Clear, I cleared that with them. I didn't just show them where their house was, but they, they wanted to show where their house was. And then we were able to ask questions about Australia and so on. So here's what I'm planning to do in the next couple of weeks. Australia just experienced horrible wildfires this last winter, our winter, their summer, right? We've experienced horrible wildfires and still are right now. So we're going to connect this with our content of human geography and talk a little bit about because one of the people in the picture here, Damien, that's on the right, is a firefighter in Australia. So we're gonna be able to talk about how these fires impacted both of the different parts. And that's what we're gonna do in the next couple of weeks. That's what I presented to my students today when they just kind of went in their mind, went, oh my gosh, this is gonna be amazing, right? So that came out of, and that was born out of my a vacation that we took and just conversations that we had and then thinking, hmm, I wonder if they'd be willing to do this. The other one was a family member who was in a certain spot. So there's a number of different ways that you can connect with this. So with these couple of, uh, of examples in mind, okay, and an idea of strategies on how to connect, you know, on how to make that fit with your, with your content and the purpose, the next step is to understand what tool works best, right? And so we're on Zoom here, right? Or we're on a webinar, but we're basically using Zoom. And I think we're, we've become pretty proficient at Zoom. The amazing thing to me is that I'd never used this too much before. Like, once we got into Zoom in the spring and we all of a sudden you were, you were doing things with your friends or your family and you just go, hey, I'll send you a Zoom link. It's like, why wasn't I bringing people into my classroom for the last you know, five years? It would have been easy, right? You just throw out a Zoom link or a Google Hangout link and you bring them in. So the world is one link away. And in this modern day, you know, who knows what's going to happen with our schedule moving forward. If we are structured back into certain hours of the day where we're in class, it makes it a little bit more challenging. But right now, 
it's pretty much whatever time of the day that would work as long as you can get connected with them. So Flipgrid is a little bit different of a situation. I just want to show real quick here. If we go to Flipgrid, but I already had it pulled up. Oh, if I do right here. Okay, so if we go to Flipgrid, right along the top up here is Grid Pals. And that's what I mentioned earlier. And so if I click on Grid Pals, you do have a toggle here that you need to toggle one way or the other. And so I'm at active, so I can connect with me. I can search by grade level. I can search by subject level. But if I go down to the map, you'll notice that if I zoom out, there are Grid Pal teachers on Flipgrid from all over the world that I can connect with. Right. And if I click on this particular spot here, for example, it gives me information about them and what they teach. And I can send them an invite or send, you know, find them on Twitter, whatever it might be, however I want to set that up. You can also see some information about them down here. So think about the power of the old pen pals back in the day, long time ago, where you'd write letters back and forth. How about a video blog, video pals, right? You do video pals and you share with one another and you share an idea for them and they share an idea back to you. And now you can do that globally, right? And, and Flipgrid allows you the opportunity to be able to do that. Blogs, again, same type of thing. You could create your own blog and have other, student, other classes in other areas uh, create a blog as well, or you can just kind of connect back and forth with those blogs. You can do that within your own district, right? Breaking down the four walls of your classroom to do it that way. We've mentioned Twitter. Uh, here's an example, global classroom. If I just type in hashtag global classroom, it comes up with a number of different things that teachers are sharing from around the world. And if I scroll down here, you'll notice, I mean, you can see all the different ones. You can look them on your own, but this one right here, who can help my kids? We want to connect with your class for a mystery state. Okay, please share and message me if interested. Right there. You want to do a mystery state with an elementary school classroom? I'm assuming that is, but looking at the students through there, there you go. There's a connection for you. And Twitter is not something you don't have to join, right? You can get to it on your own and be able to look at it without joining it and be able to make those connections that are there as well. And then finally, shared Google Docs. Right? Shared Google Docs works not just with your students in your classroom or in your community, but it works within your country. It works globally. So when we were doing, which I'm going to talk about here in just a minute, but when we were doing one of our projects, we were working with Uganda. And so we put together a, before we did a Google Hangout with them, we put together a document there was questions that my students were going to come up with or have for Isaac and Rachel in Uganda. And we were able to preview and preset the questions that we had for them. But I then shared this document with Isaac and Rachel in Uganda prior to our Google Hangout. So they already had some ideas and some feedback. And then in the, in the weeks that followed, they then interacted on a Google Hangout with people from around the world about the project that they were working on. So there's a number of different ways that you can make this happen. When, when we're talking about connecting with people globally. However, there are some considerations that you do need to take into account, right? And these, are, I found this out the hard way, actually doing this my own self. But when you we'll talk about these considerations, you need to think about if you're talk, if you're, if we're trying to connect with people around the world, time zones and language barriers, right? So those become something you have to consider. Time zones become an issue, just a prime example. I've done Google Hangouts. Chrissy Hellier from our Shifting Schools has been a mystery guest for me. Uh, sometimes she'd get up at three in the morning to try and do it. So if it depends on what time of day, you're trying to make sure you consider that and put that together. Also, everybody that's joining you from a different time zone has to really do significant consideration to make sure that they're on the right time that you are. So we had one Zoom meeting that was planned with Uganda that was missed because they got the time wrong by an hour. Right, we weren't able to do it. That's when we were brick and mortar. And then the challenge to that is then we missed it completely. Uh, we also had a situation where, when you, oh, you talk about reliability and backup plans, where when we were trying to meet with someone, they, their internet was not working. And it was interesting, it was a really great learning experience, but you have to be prepared for the fact that you got this plan, you got it's all ready to go, and then it's gonna just break down, right? Because the internet happens, the internet gets broken, or you know, a certain thing, the internet doesn't work at certain times, or there's power outages. And it wasn't able, we weren't able to connect with them because they hadn't paid their internet tax. So as a country where we were talking with, they hadn't paid their internet tax. And they figured out that they hadn't paid their internet tax. They got on the phone, paid the internet tax, boom, they were on and we got ready to go. But you talk about that great learning experience for my students. They're like, what internet tax? Are you kidding me? They haven't like, what, what's, what's the deal? And so there was all so that led to a conversation, right? So there's, you just gotta be prepared and ready to go in case something doesn't work. And then obviously the, you know, the privacy and appropriateness piece, if you're gonna let, you know, do a YouTube 
uh, live or recording, you know, and you have students that are on there, it depends on how you're going to use that. And so just really consider those things and pre-plan those questions like I had there as well. So I mentioned Isaac and Rachel a couple of times. And so as I, as I mentioned Isaac and Rachel, okay, I want you to be, I, I want to put forth the power of service learning. Okay, and adding service learning to your teaching strategies. And what service learning is, is putting students in positions to do projects that are very real in nature. So they're not hypotheticals. They're not a hypothetical, what would you do if this? They are real situations. And this started for me with AP with We. And it's a whole other program that, you know, you're welcome to message me or email me at steveatshiftingschools.com if you want to about that. But this global awareness can lead to social concern for them. And the idea is that you take the content of your course and you put them into situations of projects that are real world projects, meeting with real world people. And if you seek out those programs and organizations, okay, that can provide your students these opportunities, it is the most powerful thing I've ever done in my 20 plus years worth of teaching. And so what we were able to do and what we were able to put together for these students is work together with Isaac and Rachel in Uganda, and that's a picture of them on the left there, meeting with us in a Uganda district for the people of Uganda, Uganda. And so my students have worked helping them fundraise and build hospitals, as well as provide medical supplies and food resources and whatever else is gonna try and be there. And I basically have let go of, other than the organizational piece, I've let the students take ownership of that and work with them across the lines of what we're dealing with globally. And it's just an extremely powerful, powerful situation uh, to allow students to be able to, to do that. Um, and, I, and I can't emphasize how much it creates that global awareness and that empathy for them to get a chance to talk about it. And some great things happen. In one of them, I know I gotta wrap up here. One of them that was a powerful piece is Isaac and Rachel were meeting with us. And one time they chose to meet with us, they then pulled in one of the other people that worked with them at the hospital. Isaac is, nat uh, is native to Uganda, but another who is from there who didn't speak much English. And so they were having to kind of translate to my students and talk with them about what it's like to grow up in Uganda. And it was just really powerful. I just, I, I, I can't emphasize enough how significant that is. So in closing, before we get to a little collaborative activity and then also questions and answers, the key learnings that I want you to take away from thinking about how do you create global citizens through technology is understanding why it is so important that we go global and hopefully I've made that point, how you can connect globally, right? Giving you some strategies to be able to do that. And there's many more than just what I've presented here, but just those are some. And then what are some of the tools that you can use to connect globally? The takeaways is I don't want you to walk away from this thing. That's too big. That's not something that I can do. Those are, those are things that take a long time to do. No, start simple. Start with a simple type of activity and a guest coming in that's familiar for you and you'll grow from there. Okay? Network locally and expand, right? Network locally with people around you that you know, and then you can expand from there and just be fully aware of opportunities, right? One time we were on a, we were on a camping trip Okay, and actually that's where the, the connection with Isaac and Rachel came from. We were on a camping trip and they happened to be there and we were just talking about what they were doing and where they were, you know, they're back home. And all of a sudden in my mind, in the middle of the conversation, I went, would you guys, would you guys ever be willing to be a part of something that we're doing in my classroom? And they said, yes. And it's been a three year relationship that we've been doing. So it's been great. So in the words of inspiration, I would say is, is take a risk, step out of your comfort zone and have fun with it. Okay? It's not going to be perfect. It's going to be a lot of you know, learning and falling down and failing, but fail fast, fail loud or fail proud, right? Like Chrissy says, okay? and you'll be able to make something amazing happen for your students. So I'll pause there, Jeff, unless you think we should jump right into the collaborative piece, but are there any questions or anything that we want to address? No, I think people are pretty quiet. It's pretty nice. So you're, you're going right along so um okay. i think we can jump into the collaborative piece i think that's great and maybe uh, we'll have people start asking some questions in the chat or be able to clarify some things sounds good so have a global connection okay you know how do, how do you um have a global connection you can join this shifting schools community on google my maps and so in what jeff has shared with you and he'll put it into the chat as well is a link okay to google my maps i've also included a link down here okay in the lower right that is a video from me explaining to you how you could create the Google My Maps like this if you're wanting to do it. Right now, I have a Google My Maps, and I'm going to go ahead and click on this here. I have a Google My Maps for...
families because I want them to be able to participate in this. This is yours. This is our going to be our, and I'll kind of manage it and take a look at it. And I hope that it just blows up. I've started with putting a few of my contacts in here, okay, or, or shifting schools contacts in here, as well as a few other people from our, like I said, shifting schools or from our district as well that we're willing to share. But the idea of this is this is an editable map for you that you can add any contacts that you might have. So for example, if you have a contact in Brazil, right? You just click on this add marker right up here at the top. Let's say you had a contact somewhere around here. What I would ask that you do is you put in here the name of your contact or the country name, I guess would be the other way to do that, country name. Then you could put your name so we know who to contact. In the description, you could say, I have a friend who works in zoology, you know, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, or something, I don't know, something, whatever it might be. And then the contact information, you would put how we would contact you. I don't want you to put the contacts information because there's privacy issues and such that are there. But if you're willing to say, hey, contact me and I'll check and see if that person would be willing to join your classroom. We now all of a sudden have a global resource to be able to contact anybody that we potentially want to. And we can share with one another to be able to do that. So I'm not going to go through right now and share with you the how you create this. That's what's in that video that I did. But if you want to hop onto this map and you have any global contacts that are out there and you can add to this map, that'd be great. But you could do that while we're doing our question and answer session. But if you want to know what's there, for example, like this one, I, I changed the icon. I should let you know how to do that. If you go here and you click on this, you can change the icon or other icons. You can change the color of what you want that to be. I added this one right here as a baseball. If you click on it, uh, that's a former player of mine who Jeff's had the privilege of meeting actually, he's retired now, but living in Arizona that would be happy to come to your class and talk to your class about what it's like to be a professional athlete. He played in Japan for five years. He'd talk about what it's like to be in Japan. Uh, he'd be somebody that would be able to, to do that for you. Just contact me and I would get in touch with him. So that's how this is going to work if we wanna be a part of that. So before I stop sharing, I guess that's something I can do. I can stop sharing. Just thank you. Okay, I hope you'll use these tips to go out and deliver a, you know, that memorable global experience for your students. It is about experiences. It's about experiences for all of our students, especially right now when times are tough, right? It's not just about just the learning and just the hard hitting pieces. It's about the experiences and giving them an opportunity to go home. This is more than anything else, something that my students have gone home and I'm sure said to mom and dad, guess what we did in class today, right? As opposed to just some worksheet, right? They're going home and saying, we talked with Uganda today. We talked with Haiti today. We talked with Nicaragua today. We talked with the Middle East today, right? Uh, th it's just a, a huge part of making them intrinsically involved and engaged in what they're doing. So thanks for being here, everybody. Uh, we got some question and answer time. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. Awesome. Yeah. And um, uh, please head over. Uh, Catherine just said, that's amazing. A little overwhelming, but a goal for myself. It is a little overwhelming, but I think, you know, to what Steve is saying is, is start small. You, you, it's amazing how fast these networks grow. Uh, and even, I love the idea of this, my map. I've already gone in and added in my information. Uh, some of you might know that I, I've, I'm on my 56 countries and stalled at the moment uh, that I visited and I've lived in three. So I, I could talk about living in the Middle East, uh, China and Thailand. So I put my contact on there. Uh, you can just go to that mind map right now. And, and if, have you lived somewhere else? And like, maybe, maybe you just, you live in the Tri-Cities, you put in the Tri-Cities, like there, you don't know, right? Um, and all you have to do is you go to the mind map, there's a search box up at the top, you can search click on little add, add to map button, fill in the details uh, and good to go. And it'd be great if we can just start to gather some of that information uh, and start to build this community of amazing connections. And you just never know, right? It starts so small. It starts with meeting people on a camping trip. <laughs> you know, it starts with exchange students and uh, you just not, you're not sure where it all ends. Yeah. So. Yeah. And then, I mean, and then that's, that's the thing I, you know, I don't want it to be overwhelming. I know it can seem that way. And, and Jeff knows this cause he lived through me talking with him about my struggles and such. It's like, I want to do more of this. I want to do more of it. I want to do more of it. How do I make this happen? How do I make this happen? It is a slow process. Okay. And it's going to take some effort and it's going to take some time, but what is, again, I always forget Jeff saying what's, what seems simple to you, what seems normal to you is amazing to everybody else. And that's, the, that's I cannot even emphasize how important that is to the students. 
Like yeah. what you think is, ah, oh, that's not that big a deal. They'll think that's corny. Think that's silly. If it's somebody that's from outside what they normally see and talking about a topic, that's what you're talking about or anything. They think it's amazing. And yeah. the idea of being able to connect through, you know, through zoom, like bringing them into your zoom, this is something that is easily done in this environment that we are with this online distance learning, but it absolutely is sustainable for when we're back brick and mortar, right? It's yeah. for sure something you can still do. Yeah. I think it's even more powerful in person because you get to have those rich discussions like you had in your classroom, yeah. right? Like when your kids are all there and you experience talking to somebody in Uganda all at the same time, you've gone through an experience together, right? We remember experiences. It's something, you know, when you think back, you remember experiences. How do we create memorable experiences for kids in school? Like when you think back through your schooling, you don't remember every algebra lesson. You don't remember every English lesson, but you remember that time when you helped build a hospital in, in Uganda. Like you remember that. That's an experience that you had. And that's the thing I love about this. And for better or for worse, the timing couldn't be better with everybody going through this pandemic and going through everything we've been going through for the last six months. And Steve, I love this. You know how the technology works. That was always our hurdle, right? Our hurdle was, well, I don't know how to get onto Zoom or set up a Zoom. You already, it's done. We all know it. Everybody in the world, everybody in the world knows how to do it. We're all on the same playing field. Now you just got to find the connection, right? Find the connection. Another thing you might want to try is if this seems overwhelming, you don't know where to start. There are a lot of global collaborative projects out there. One of my favorites, and I'm going to share it in the chat for you now, is the Flat Classroom uh, Project uh, by a good friend of mine, Julie Lindsay, out of Australia. And she's been doing the Flat Classroom Projects for 10 plus years, I'm going to say. Uh, I actually, she flew me into Dubai once to do a conference with kids came all from all around the world to go to a conference in Dubai and do a Flat Classroom Project. But you don't have to take your kids there because of technology we can actually do these projects. So Julie over on her website, Julie Lindsay, has a bunch of global projects that you can join. Now, what you need to do is head over there. You can scroll through them, find which ones which meet with your standards, and your kids are connected to other kids. And it, through these amazing collaborative projects, it's just incredible, you know? I mean, the resources that we have available right now are, are endless. Or the idea yeah, of using... I used, I threw over there Kiva.org and uh, Steve, I don't know if you've ever mm -hmm. done Kiva.org. Yeah, we, we did as part of our projects. Yes. Kiva is yeah. fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And, and even start with kids where kids are like, we want to help fund this. We want to raise the $75. And then your next question is, how do you raise the money? Right. And we get kids yep. to be thinking and it's experiences. We need it's to not be just thinking how you raise in terms it, of experiences. It, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. It's no, not just how you raise the money. It's then what do you do with it? How are you going to decide who you're going to invest exactly. with and, and, and have that conversation? What's your goal? What do you want? And, and there's so much that can be learned from that that is beyond just school or school room learning. It's about citizenship. Yeah. It's about global citizenship. It's about who you want to help. And the great part about Kiva is then it gets paid back. Yeah. Now, if you it get gets to paid, reuse it the money. On, you reuse it and then you find the next person yeah. to be able to do it. And, and it's just, it's, it really truly is about shifting that mindset to realize that anything is amazing. To, to be able to bring in for your students and being aware of those opportunities. I was, th I was thinking to a student that I had a few years ago who's now graduated. She's significantly involved with, uh, what was the right, 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 right word, environmental issues, right? And helping mm -hmm. animals and such and being able to um, advocate for that. And she has spoken to the legislature at times. And so she was a senior, I think last year, she was a senior last year and was, speaking to the Washington state legislature, but she was doing a full-time running start. So she wasn't around school, but somehow she had texted me and said, Hey, watch me. Here's the link to that particular you know, presentation when I do yeah. that. And we happened to be in the classroom that was her fellow classmates. And so we threw it up on the board and here comes global is issues coming in, right? Where she's talking to, to that. And so it's a matter of being willing to shift what you're doing, take advantage of the opportunity that's been presented to you in the moment. That's a ch challenging part. Give up on, you know, kind of your structured curriculum yeah. and make that work. Uh, but just listen to what's out there and who you're talking to. And like, you know, this could be a part of it. And then just take that risk to give it a go. And you'll be amazed, I think, especially with what your students will respond with. Yeah. And, and I know you know somebody you can bring into your classroom. I mean, there's just, I mean, to your point, you know, I think a lot of times we overlook the connections we have. 
whether that's a connection in Facebook or that's a connection on Twitter or your neighbor, like you just don't know, right? Uh, you get talking to people and a lot of times, you know, um, we overlook the connections that are right in front of us that are just sitting there. Uh, so be thinking about that. And again, there's uh, one of my challenges, like I've challenged school districts as they start this school year. One of my, one of my challenges to teachers right now is once a week, have a guest speaker into your Zoom meeting. You can do this. And people, like you said, people are willing to give 10, 15, 30 minutes to come talk to kids. Uh, and everybody knows the tech. Like start making your list. What's your goal? You know, what's your goal? How do you, how are you going to bring people, bring the world to your kids? If you can't take your kids into the world, find a way to bring the world to your kids. And we yeah. all know how the technology and, works. And, and we have ability to be able to communicate. I know Jeff, you talk in you know, trainings that you do a lot about communicating with authors, right? Or yeah. an elementary school classroom, communicating with an author. You know, I was working with somebody, I can't remember, it might've been part of Reimagine, I don't, I don't remember, but was teaching a marketing class. And they had a project that they called uh, fantasy football. Yeah. But what they, what, they were, what they were doing is not fantasy football. What they were doing is they had to start a franchise, right? So they had to start a franchise all the way down to the colors and the logo and, and all of that. And the, the commentary or what came up and what came out of it was, well, why wouldn't you contact the, uh, the Seahawks or why wouldn't you contact yeah. the, the Mariners and, and see if somebody would be willing to pop in for 40 minutes to say, this is what we have to consider when we're, we're establishing a franchise. That's yeah. good PR for them. It's you just gotta, I mean, you, you got to find that right time to be able to make it happen. But don't be afraid to reach out to people like that, especially in this current environment where everybody's yeah. doing things through Zoom. Yeah. And they want to be able to promote those yeah. things. It's a great way for you to make those connections. The other thing I think about, especially, you know, I, I know looking at the names that are here um, listening, I know there are a lot of high school teachers. And I think one of the things that high school teachers could really leverage is, first of all, understand that every public service employee has an email account and 99% of them also have a Twitter account. So if you want your local representative to come talk to your kids, have your kids email them, have your kids tweet them, have your students reach out at a high school level. You know, we have environmental and I'll use Enum Claw as an example, right? We have environmental issues in Enum Claw that we want to talk to our representative about. And I have, when I have seen schools do this, where the kids reach out to the representative I have not had a representative yet that hasn't responded and come and either through Zoom or come and visit the classroom to talk to kids because they're not stupid. That's a future voter. <laughs> Those kids are like two years away from being voters and they want to be reelected. And it's really good when you're in, in that school or in that classroom talking to kids. And we have this opportunity. All you have to do is email them and their email is public. It's just sitting there. You know, so if you're a social studies teacher or you want to do environmental or you want to know why the environmental laws are the way they are in your, you know, your county or your city, reach out to a city, you know, official. Um, there's just so many even, ways that we can bring these in. Even better. Have your students reach out to them. Yes. Have your students be the ones that have to write the email, teach them how to write the email or how do you get them to be able to join. And they're even more likely to do that if you all of a sudden now have a 17 year old or 16 year old saying, Hey, can you please join my classroom and, and talk to us about a few things we've had our representative 35 of them. Here. What if you had every kid write them? <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. We've, we've had our representative come into my classroom and come here before and wanted to, wanted to be able to talk with our students for a, for a class period. You know, it, 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 there are opportunities that are there if you seek them out and little, little promo for a webinar that's coming up down the road here that, myself and JB are going to do, but talking about expanding the, the walls of your classroom to like locally and be able to be involved locally. And we're going to probably talk a little bit more about national and local regional than just you know global, but it fits, it crosses over, right? Yeah. Have them write, have them write a, a response to the New York times, have them write a letter to the editor or a response to an article in the New York times, because the New York times has a very challenging, I guess, what would you call it? Editor or somebody who's filtering yeah, whether those comments board, make yeah. it on there. And we've done that in AP government before. And they literally, they have a, an explanation of this is what we're looking for in our commentary. This is what we want to be able to write. And so you have them practice writing and then they work with one another about what that writing is. And they, and then you throw the article up on your screen and you have them write in real time yeah. and post it. And this happened to me last year. It was like, or it was last two years ago, two years ago where they posted it on there and all of a sudden their comment pops up and everybody's like, Hey, so-and-so's comments up there. <laughs> and then it gets bumped up to an editor's pick. 
right? Because they wrote it so good. And then they I'll all want to know that. how they got it bumped up to an editor's pick. And they're arguing with one another. And now you got passion and, and it's about real world, real world stuff. <laughs> now you got so, engagement. Cool. Now you've got engagement. Yeah. 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 There's so many ways to do this. And it's just, you know, and again, if it, I can't find a school or a district that somewhere in their mission or vision statement doesn't say our goal is to make global citizens and you can't make global citizens, you know, staying in the four walls of your classroom. And I know you and JB Blair, you guys have an incredible other webinar coming up here in a couple of weeks um, that talks about doing this locally. The other thing I was thinking about too, is, you know, a lot of times we, we, we think about the technology that we need to use and you can, I mean, yeah, if you can use zoom or Skype or, you know, name any one of these, these video tools, that's fantastic. But much like you were saying, there are a lot of places where the bandwidth won't handle that. So using something like a shared word document or a shared Google doc, where you can literally just share the document and you can use it like a chat room. And just think about that for a second. If you had a group of students who were in a chat room where they couldn't see each other, right? Like you, you, you physically can't see each other and you have to learn to be respectful. You have to learn to try and decipher what is actually being meant when you can't read somebody's body language. If we set up some of those situations as well, where you had to get to know someone via a chat room, to me that I just wonder, could we help to start influencing some of the bad comments that are all over Facebook? Yes. You know, when you're trying to, because you're, you, people read into those things and you don't know because you can't see. And we can set up some of those structures. And the nice thing about using like a, a shared Word document or a shared Google Doc or go find a free chat room, they're all over the place as well. Um, but you don't need a very strong internet connection to do that, right? Like it's a, it's a very, you, you've just reduced the amount of bandwidth that you need in a place like Uganda or Kenya or, you know, I mean, I've got, I've got connections at, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, you know, um, where you would just want to, I mean, those, the kids, the kids at the school that I worked with in Ethiopia build their own computers. They all run on open source Linux. Like they would blow any American kid out of the water when it comes to computers because they build their own computers to go to school because they have to, you know? Well, here's, cool here's my, end. we're coming, coming up to the end here, but here's my latest, my latest pipe dream about that is you talk about Google documents. What about a Google classroom? Yep. What about finding somebody in Canada or finding somebody in Brazil or whatever that's teaching a similar topic and a similar subject and go, Hey, how about we put together a Google classroom and we, we teach these kids of the similar age group from different cultures, the content that we're, we're still, we're still talking about or we're, we're, we're trying to teach. Um, and where I, where that was born out of is, I mean, Jeff, you know, I use the Google question portion on Google classroom, right? It's like yeah. a chat room, right? It's like yeah. that different piece. And so that's where I first started thinking about it. And I went, well, why wouldn't we just you know, co-teach from two different countries, uh, a course or a unit or something? Uh, yeah. That's, uh, I, haven't, I don't know when that's going to happen. That, that's my goal though. That's, that's where I'm yeah. trying to put something together. And Yeah. Figure, and I yeah. think, you know, I mean, you've, you've been in this a little longer than, than others, but I think the idea of using grid pals, like there's some teachers out there that, you know, it's as simple as doing something like that. that Julie Lindsay, um, who that last link that I shared, when she started the flat classroom project, we ran it, we, ran, we did exactly that. Only we did it through Moodle. So we used Moodle back in the day, which is like Google, you know, Google classroom um, where we had that we, she would have, they would have four, they would have four classes from around the world in one, basically one Google classroom. And you were paired up with one other person from the other four schools. So you were a team of four. And as a team of four, you were given then, you had to design something or what they took on is they took on, um, how was it? The 20, 20 challenges by 2020. What was the book? There's a book out there that's like the 20, 20 global challenges by 2020. And as a team of four, you took on one of the challenges and then tried to create something that would solve it. But you never you never sat next to these people, right? And one class is in Georgia, one class was in uh, Qatar, another class was in China, you know, another class is in Australia. And so you're coming at this from so many different angles, trying to look at something like global warming, right? Where you have a, a, a kid sitting in China where the smog is so bad, you know, with somebody sitting in Georgia where they're worried about hurricanes and natural disasters on the other end of it. It's just this, it, it was... 
unbelievable when you can do that. And the thing that I would say is one thing that we do as teachers, and this is why people are looking, people are already saying they're like, Jeff, that sounds cool, but there's no way I could ever do that. It's because we overstructure learning. See, here's the problem. Those projects only work when you are allowed to let go and turn control of learning over to the students. If, If you're thinking there's no way I can do that, I can't figure out the structure for it. That's the wrong mindset. You're never going to, it's not about the structure. It's about creating the connections and then letting it flow. And it will happen, right? It will happen. You don't need to have every I dotted and every T crossed before you jump into a project like that. Find another passionate teacher and say, we're going to throw our kids into Google Classroom. What are you working on? Oh, this standard? We're working on this standard? Awesome. Let's see what the kids could do with it, right? And mix it up. You have to have a little more structure in the elementary, but by high school, you just start, I, I love that idea, right? Co-teaching on the Google Classroom. Throw your kids in there. You, we, this stuff can be done. And, and, I, and I, would, I would agree with that. And, you know, just everybody that's, that's, that's here, just know that my, my history of my teaching, I would go back and I would look at the first portion of it. Type A guy, right? Type A perfectionist that wants things in a certain place. And so the idea of giving up control in my classroom was a challenge to let go of. And it's yeah. been the best thing that I've ever done. It's been the best thing for me to do, ever do professionally. I still think I have some places, some areas of growth to happen with that. But it's almost, I don't want to say it's like flip-flopped where you don't, you, you have an intended outcome, yeah, but you let absolutely. the students kind of get there on their own. And then it's amazing how many new learning opportunities are created from doing that. Like yeah. it, it's almost a lot, a lot of the stuff that I learned about how to do this. I hadn't, I didn't plan. I didn't plan. Right. Like it just was like, we're going to try this thing. And then all of a sudden out of it became, well, let's do this. Oh, that was an yeah. amazing activity then. Yeah. So you have to be willing to take that risk and let that go. Yeah. And I think your whole Uganda thing was like, we're going to talk to somebody in Uganda. They're talking about what it's like in Uganda and your kids are like, how do we help? What can we do? Yeah. And all of yeah. a sudden you're like, I don't know, let's ask. What can we do? Yeah. How do we help? <laughs> oh, you can help us build this hospital. Okay, what do you need? And, and then next thing you know, you're in a service learning project, right? So you, yeah. your yeah. job is to create that connection. We need to become connected educators, right? Connected educators are the future. Um, it's, it's something that robots can, can't take away from you. <laughs> it's connecting yeah. humans to humans. Uh, they will not replace you if you become a connected educator. So figure out how, how do you connect, how do you become that connector for your kids? Uh, and support kids in doing that. So awesome. Well, thank you, Steve. Thank you so much. Uh, the presentation link is there. All of the links are in. Everything that he has shared is linked into that slide deck. I will share that slide deck one more time here at the bottom. Uh, if you're listening to the podcast, you can get the slide deck, all the other links that we've shared in the chat. If you weren't here live, uh, you will be able to get those in the show notes of the podcast as well. Uh, and we've got a ton more of these coming up. Actually, we've got a really, um, we've got a really quick turnaround. If you want to on Monday, if you listen to the podcast, it'll probably already be passed. But uh, for you, for those of you here in the webinar, the, what are there about 1.2 million of you here? That's awesome. Um, for the 1.2 million of you that are here live in the webinar on Monday, we have Jennifer Abrams, who's going to be talking about engaging in hard conversations. So whether you are a tech coach, whether you are a teacher, maybe you're an administrator, if you've ever found yourself, or even just in a personal life, um, wanting to some strategies around how do you have hard conversations with parents, kids, uh, coworkers, uh, she has written a book on it. And I'm so excited to have her here. That'll be Monday. Uh, the, web, the webinar registration link will be up right after this one. Uh, I think Chrissy's probably working on it now. And uh, Steve's will be out in podcast episode if you want to share it out to your, your friends and colleagues here in about a week as well. So thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Thank, Appreciate all that you're you. doing. Yeah. Uh, and I look forward thank to you, us everybody. using this Shifting Schools Global Connection Map. I want to see more more people in there. Feel free to share that, tweet that out. Let's get that thing. uh, Let's get the thing rocking and rolling, create connections together. So thanks everyone. That's my hope. hope. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Thanks for everything you're doing for, for kids and for families. And I pop my email in there. Feel free to email me. I'm happy to chat with you if you have any ideas about what you want to do globally. So awesome. Thanks Steve. Yep.